Yes, great, uh, great songs this morning. <laughs> Appreciate all the singing and sharing together. <clears throat> I shared with the prayer team. They were asking about the message. I'm going to be in first, or I'm going to be in Joshua three, one through three. But uh, yeah, I see the Bibles. Oh, I got some got Bibles holding up. That's good. <laughs> um, of course, you know, after a Sunday service every week, my mind starts to go on. Okay, God, what what next week? What what you know? What do you want to say? And so Wednesday, this happened. It hasn't happened for a while for me, but generally it takes longer in the week for me to kind of get things settled. But Wednesday morning, I was praying, and God just seemed to kind of bring scriptures and thoughts and you know to me, and I began to just write them down, uh, trying to research and concordance commentaries if I needed you know more assistance with some things. But uh, I just and then you know, and I had the message all done pretty much uh, you know before noon. And then in the afternoon, we got the word that we're put off till July. <laughs> and I'm thinking, hmm, I wonder why this message? Why did God give me this? Because he would know that was going to happen, right? <laughs> and so uh, I guess we'll all have to decide for ourselves what maybe their message is for and the reason. I believe it's a twofold message, <clears throat> which I think is always the case, but I believe it's definitely for each of us individually. Uh, especially in what's going on right now in our time, in our world, and, and, and with us at Harvest Point. And I think it's also for the church. I've entitled the message Preparation, uh, talking about preparation for us as Christians as we move forward individually in our lives with what's going on, and also Preparation Harvest Point Church. Let me read Joshua for your hearing. Joshua 3. You've heard this before. I've, I've used this scripture, I'm sure, before, no doubt. <clears throat> Excuse me. Early in the morning, Joshua and all the Israelites set out from Shittim and went to the Jordan, where they camped before crossing over. After three days, the officers went throughout the camp, giving orders to the people. When you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God and, and the priests who are Levites carrying it, you're to move out from your positions and follow it. Then you'll know which way to go, since you've never been this way before. Um, I'm going to read a little more, but let me just say something about that. I think it'd be fair to say to us that in our world with what's happening right now, as far as uh, the virus, the economy, the protests, and even us trying to get into a building, we've never been this way before. Would you agree with me? We've never been this way before. Amen. And so he says, but keep a distance about a thousand yards between you and the ark and don't go near it. And then here comes a key. Joshua told the people. Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. For tomorrow, the Lord will do amazing things among you. As I was thinking, you know, about this uh, in preparation, as we, you know, in our own lives, preparation. I'm thinking of, you know, following Christ, moving forward in our own spiritual life and journey, as well as Harvest Point. All right, and when we can actually get into a facility and and move forward. And, and how that, uh, and, and I had these thoughts, I wrote them down, <laughs> and so maybe that'll make sense, with all the challenges <laughs> and opportunities that are before us. And right now there are challenges. There's challenges with us in this zoning occupancy thing. Uh, there's challenges in our lives, probably some of us, you know, with finances, I don't know, you know, sicknesses, uh, difficulties that are taking place, challenges people facing in the workforce, uh, you know, how do we prepare for some of these things that, that you know, come upon us that we're not ready for? How do we prepare for that? Uh, and I was thinking even about, you know, the new facility when we get in there. Uh, you know, things are going to be so different. We've been Zooming now for what, a uh, couple months or more? And now we're going to Zoom for probably another six, seven weeks. And so we've got a custom, at least I have, to seeing you on a screen. And uh, the difference, how that looks. And we can all kind of see each other when we're in a worship service. We won't really see each other face to face sometimes. We'll be looking forward, worship, preaching. So that's going to be different. Uh, and of course, not being in a facility for a long time, we're going to walk into this big, huge gymnasium worship part. And that's going to be different. <laughs> uh, 
you know, it's not going to be the cozy little place that we were in. So it's going to feel different. You know what I'm saying? It's going to feel different. It, it, it's going to be noisier because the sound acoustics is not going to be too good until we can do some things for that. Uh, so it's it's a new day that we're facing right now with the virus, with the economy, with protests. It's a new day with this building trying to get ready uh, for all of that. And, and by the way, thank God for the elders and especially uh, for Ken and Art. Uh, and 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 Ken, God bless you, Ken. Yeah. <laughs> taking on this crazy thing that you had to get ready for. Uh, we just appreciate you. But, you know, everything's going to be different. That, that's my whole point, uh, you know, as, as, as we get into a facility. It's going to be awesome, you know, worship and all this new lots of room, you know, uh, things that we're going to be able to enjoy, the playground for the kids, the pavilion to have fellowship in. Uh, exciting times, you know, and there's a lot of anticipation, but there's a lot of anxiety too, and it's a whole new journey. And so that's, it was kind of that way for the Israelites. It was going to be a whole new journey. They, they'd never been this way before. And so and when I talk about preparation, the first thing, first point that I want to share with you is this. <clears throat> Excuse me, we have to keep our focus. Hebrews, the 12th chapter, I'd like to read for you, and I'll be, I'll be here again in Hebrews. But in Hebrews, the 12th chapter, uh, uh, verse 1 and 2. Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders, uh, the King James says weights, and the sin that so easily entangles or besets us. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author, perfecter, finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Uh, keeping the focus, okay? What we have here is when he talks about fixing your eyes on Jesus, he's talking about concentrating. He's talking about keeping the focus where it needs to be. As you heard earlier in my pastoral prayer, uh, you know, keeping the focus where we need to be, understanding we're in a war. We're in a spiritual battle for our own lives as well as for the lives of others uh, in this, you know, our communities, our churches across the land, our nation. And so we have to concentrate and keep the focus on Jesus. Uh, now, he likens this. I'm sure you understand this. This is likened to the games, the Grecian games back then. It's likened to an athletic con you know, contest that's taken place when he uses the word throw off all the weights, you know, that, that hinder you. Get rid of that. Keep your focus on Jesus. And when you keep your focus on Jesus, it helps us to handle the tasks that are set before us that we need to be doing when we keep the focus. It, it, it helps us to do the, the work that God wants us to do. Listen to this, in the midst of distractions, and there are a lot of distractions, in the, in the midst of setbacks, and there are setbacks in the midst of the busyness, and, you know, and keeping our focus, quote, on harvest. Now, when I say harvest, you know, when I came to the church there, I asked Vera, you know, why is it called the Harvest Point Church? And she reminded me of the scripture, you know, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Pray for the laborers for the harvest. And so we have to keep our focus on the harvest, that there are souls that need Jesus. Even right now, as we're Zooming, there are people that need Christ, maybe in our own congregation, maybe friends and family. And, and, and that needs to be our focus on Jesus and the harvest of souls, and then we'll be able to accomplish that if we keep our focus and centered on Christ, you know, so that we can avoid the, the setbacks and the hindrances that come our way. And, and, and if we keep our focus centered on Christ, then we're going to have less stress. Uh, if we don't keep our focus on Jesus and we start looking at all the stuff that's going on around us, uh, you're going to be stressed out. And I think some of you have been stressed this week from what I heard. <laughs> yeah, I see a few nods of a couple folks that are in front of me. Uh, stressed out, you know, uh, just because of family, job, you, you name it, whatever it can be. But when we keep our focus and centered on Christ, it helps us solve the crisis a little better. Uh, and the reason that the focus is so important is that when we focus on Jesus, it helps our attention 
to be on the moment, the present task, and not down the road. Uh, you know, sometimes I know I have a little difficulty with this. It's always like, well, what about tomorrow? What about next week? What about next month? What about next year? And so when we start to look too far ahead and start to get off of the, the moment we're in and what God wants us to do, we can lose our focus. And so centering on Christ helps us that. It deals better with the distractions. Now, there are things that can help us lose our focus. I'm going to share some of those, some of the ways that we can lose our focus. I, one of the things the Lord brought to my mind is in 1 Samuel, uh, this, this, is, this is a cool scripture, in 1 Samuel 17, you'll know this is, you know, David's going to fight Goliath, okay? And David's been victorious up this time. I mean, the bear, the lion, you know, he just went out kind of barehanded and beat him. So now he comes down and he's telling, you know, King Saul, I'll, I'll take care of Goliath. And, and here's what happens in the 38th verse. I call this... Uh, trying to use the world's wisdom and materialism to fight. And so in verse 38, Saul dressed David in his own tunic. He put a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on his head. David fastened on his sword over the tunic and notice this and tried walking around because he was not used to them. And David says, I cannot go in these, he said to Saul. I am not used to them. So he took them off. And of course, he took the staff and the stone. And I thought about this, you know, we can lose our focus if we start to go and think of using the world's wisdom and the world's way of understanding, of handling a problem, of handling distractions, of moving forward. When we start to do that, you know, David, you know, you know Saul's thinking, I'll give you all my stuff. Here, you can, you can fight the enemy with my stuff. We don't need the world's wisdom to fight what's going on, folks. We need Jesus and the mind of Christ. We need the wisdom that comes from above, not that comes from the world. We need to, to, to know what God is saying. We need to have prayer and the Spirit of God that will help us understand how do we fight this thing. This is a spiritual war we're in. And so, you know, you can lose, one of the ways you can lose your focus is to try to use what's not of God. <laughs> try to use our own human understanding, our own human efforts. Uh, and we get in trouble when we do that. I probably could preach a whole message just on that one subject, all right? When we try to use what is not this natural to us in God's realm and spirit, uh, we're going to be in trouble. And we, we've got to fight the way that God wants us to fight that. The second thing is, it was in Matthew uh, 13, 58, is unbelief. Uh, this is the scripture in Matthew uh, where... Jesus is talking to them about doing some things in his hometown. Of course, that's the one prophet, you know, without honoring his hometown. And, but verse 58, get this. It says, and he did not many miracles because of their lack of faith, their unbelief. And so we have to be careful that we don't allow the enemy to cause unbelief in us, you know, begin to doubt. You know, why is this happening? What's going to, God, why, 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 God, why, why, why? And so unbelief can be a, a hindrance uh, to lose our focus. And then back, to, of course, to Hebrews, I'd mentioned back in Hebrews 12, it says, laying aside every weight, every hindrance, everything. Uh, you know, athletes will prepare for a race. And if you notice, he said the race set before us. When he talks about this race, this is a marathon. This isn't a sprint. Folks, as a Christian, we're in a marathon race. It's not a sprint. It's not a day. It's not a week. It's not a month. It's not a year. This race we're in is the rest of our lives until we make heaven our home. And so we're in a marathon. And when athletes would train, you know, for, for races, I mean, they would use all kinds of things to help them. I, I think I said this one time to you years ago. Uh, my brother used to be a, a good runner, fast runner. And back in the day, you know, he would put uh, ankle weights on him and maybe even heavier shoes or boots. And he would run with that on him to build up, you know. But when it came time to run the race, he had to take them off or he'd have never won. He had to get rid of those extra things that he was carrying on him so he could really run the race. And so, you know, weights and can be hindrances to us in, in, our, in our running the race. You know, things that, that uh, we have to cast off that hinder our real, and it's a race of faith. And so in your life and in my, our lives, and in Harvest Point as well, 
anything that can hinder us in a race with Christ, to not keep our focus on him, to, to, to you know, have wrong attitudes or actions or whatever it may be, or personal ideas. You know, I, I, I looked at one place and they had like six things that can, you know, cause you to, to lose out, you know, uh, personal plans and programs and TVs and sports and movies and wrong books and wrong things to read. And one guy, one place even said, you know, even overeating, causing us to eat wrong foods and junk stuff, you know, can be a hindrance. And, and it just various things can be a hindrance, you know, to us uh, in our journey. Things that aren't intrinsic, they're not necessarily bad, but they can be a weight if we're not careful. And so, you know, we have to lay aside those weights. Anything that would slow us down, anything in your life that will slow you down uh, from centering and running the race with Christ, Got to get rid of that to keep the focus. The other thing was, it's called imagining hindrances. Okay, imagining hindrances. In, in Mark 16, 3, uh, this was the, the tomb. Okay, and, and they came to it and they said, well, who's going to roll the stone away? Who's going to do this? And sometimes in our lives, we can begin to think, how's this going to happen? We start imagining, you know, hindrances. How, how can we get this done? Or, how can we? How, how can I accomplish that? Uh, will this will this thing go through that we planned on doing personally in our lives, or you know, we start imagining, and when we start to imagine how, why, what's going to happen, how's this going to go on, uh, we can get fearful, we can be distracted, uh, you know, that kind of thing. Now, here's the solution. Okay, the first point was uh, focus. Center on Jesus. Second point was the ways you can lose your focus. The third point is the solution. And according to this scripture and many others, I'm going to share some with you is the solution is sanctifying and sanctification in our lives. The Holy Spirit came to change just, if you will, a, a nominal Christian, an ordinary Christian, into a real powerful Christian. One that would be totally, those disciples were totally, totally transformed. Uh, they were totally sold out to Jesus. And so that's the answer is to fulfill God's purpose for you and your life and for Harvest Point and to be successful, to be successful and complete the mission. We have to make sure we're sanctified, have the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. In John 17, 4, Jesus said this to the Father, and he said this. I have brought you glory on earth. Hmm. How? By completing the work you gave me to do. By completing the work you gave me to do. How do we do that? How, how, do, we, how do we sanctify? How do we make sure we're in, in that process? And the first thing is you got to purify your heart. <laughs> you got to purify your heart. Everything has to do with the heart. When you look at the Gospels, Jesus said this. He said, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. The heart is the, everything proceeds out of the heart. You know, comes, what comes out of my mouth comes from my heart. It comes from the center of me, who I am. And it always starts with that, making sure that our motives are right. Listen to these scriptures. In, in, in 1 Samuel 13, 14, it says, the Lord sought out a man after his own heart. And then we read in, in 1 Samuel 16, 3, the Lord doesn't look on the outparents of a man. See, that's, remember going back to how oftentimes in the church we operate on, on, on the outward appearance of a person. You know, who's the most talented? Who has the most money? Who's most gifted? Who's the most popular? Who, you know, who looks good? Yeah, and, and, and the word reminds us, God's not looking on the, he's looking for the heart. <laughs> he says, God looks at the heart. Psalms 51.10 says, create in me a pure heart, a pure heart. We have to purify, make sure our heart's pure before God. In Psalms 139, 23 and 24, you've heard me say about this, that oftentimes I pray this almost every morning. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me, test me. Know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offense in me. See if there's any offense in me purify the heart you see to to sanctify to prepare for the journey personally prepare for harvest point whatever we have to make sure we keep our focus get rid of any hindrances and weights that 
can distract us, slow us down, and then we need to sanctify ourselves. We need to, to dedicate ourselves. Sanctification means just to dedicate for a purpose. You probably can remember this scripture when I give this to you in 1 Thessalonians 5.23. And may the God of peace sanctify you wholly. Hmm. Spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless under the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Spirit, soul, body, blameless, pure before God. Uh, wow. Now, the spirit, when he talks about that, that, that's the ability in us to reason, to understand, to think. Some people might call it the conscience. And that's what God's spirit witnesses with this, with the spirit within us. And so it, within our spirit has to be aligned up and, and right before God. And then he says our soul needs to be blameless and pure before God. The soul, of course, is that that immortal part of us that God had from creation. The soul that needs to be transformed and changed and to make sure that there's nothing impure inside of me. And then he says the body also. The body. You know, the body is important. In Romans 6, 13, listen to this. It says, do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil hmm. to serve sin. Instead, give yourselves completely to God. Hmm, I like this. Give your whole body as an instrument to do what's right for the glory of God. See, sometimes I think we think, okay, my soul's good shape, my spirit, you know, I, but my body, it doesn't matter where my body goes, doesn't matter what I put in it, doesn't matter. You know, people see the body, you understand? See, they, they don't see your soul, they see your body. And so it's important that our bodies right before God, that our bodies are, you know, clean, our bodies are kept right, our body, you know, we're careful about what goes into the body, we're careful about what we do with our bodies. And so, you know, that's the sanctifying part. And we need, and, and how we do that is to keep the passion. We need to keep the passion, the focus on Christ, to fulfill God's purpose for us, to move forward, to be successful for Christ, to keep the focus we have to keep the passion and the intensity of the passion. Uh, this is important. Okay, this is important. Uh, and I, and I, I'm hoping we're on the same page. I really do. God loves everybody. I don't have a problem with that. And we're all in a journey. We're all different stages in our life. Baby Christians, more mature Christians, real mature Christians. But this is important. God uses people who are passionate for him, not just casualness not just part-time Christian, not just once in a while Christian, not just Sunday morning Christian. Even talking about prayer, the Bible says in the New Testament, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. When he's talking about fervent, he's talking about passionate. He's talking about hot, you know, hot for Jesus, intense for Jesus. You know, who, who aren't just casual part-time when I feel like it as a Christian. God uses people who are all in for him all in for him and it's going to take christians to be all in for jesus to make a difference in our world it's going to take christians who are all in for jesus who are focused and centered on him getting rid of distraction hindrances sanctifying ourselves body soul and spirit keeping that folk intense about christ to change our world to see accomplished at harvest point what we want to see accomplished for harvest point matthew 5 16 i saw something a little different here when i was doing some research this is a kind of a favorite scripture. It says, so let your light so shine before men that may see your good deeds and glorify your God. Let your, you know, I think, okay, let your light shine. A little candle, you know, hold up a little candle. Let your light so shine. And, and I thought this was good. And I wrote this down. We ought to be, if we're so intense, if we're really sold out to Jesus and passion for him, there's no way our light can't shine. If I'm really passionate, I'm really sold out for Jesus, people are going to see that. You know? Now, if I'm just a casual Christian, a part-time Christian, just now and then, I'm not sure you can be that. But if I am, if that's a case, uh, my light isn't going to shine very brightly. Uh, you know, if you have a flashlight and the battery starts to go dim, you don't see too far. <laughs> and so you got to put the new ever readies in there, you know, or whatever, uh, so that you can have the strong light. So Colossians says this. It says, and whatever you do, 317 Colossians, whatever you do, whether in word or deed, get this, do it all 
Do it all in the name of Jesus Christ. Do it all for him. Do it for his glory. Be passionate about for him. You know, whatever you do, uh, <laughs> if you're cleaning a room, you know, I know there's different people cleaning the room. I, I, I mentioned names, I'll forget somebody, so I don't want to do that. Uh, but you clean the rooms for Harvest Point, do it for Jesus. <laughs> you do some painting, do it for Jesus. Uh, you pull weeds out in front, which needs to be done, I see. Do it for Jesus. I did a few of them, but not many. I had to go, but do it for Jesus. Uh, if you usher, do it for Jesus. If you give your money, do it for Jesus. If you had a part of a service, do it for Jesus. If you're a greeter, do it for Jesus. You know, whatever you do, word or deed, how you talk, how we act, what we do, do it for him. And it says, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So. Here's my closing thought for us. Let's keep the focus, folks. Let's keep centered on Jesus, okay? Eliminate any distractions and hindrances, weights in your life, whatever they can be. Sanctify our hearts. Make sure they're pure. Uh, make sure that our spirit is in line with his spirit. And make sure our, our soul's pure and our bodies are, 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 are living right. Have the passion for Christ and his work that he's called us to do. Spend time to keep spiritually fit in prayer, in the word, and in fellowship when we're going to have that opportunity. And remember, God is in control. And here's maybe what our prayer should be. Lord, make me more like Jesus. I surrender everything to you. Lord, bless your people this morning. May this word resound in their hearts and may our lives be changed as we prepare in jesus name amen